and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. Not long ago, we did a a show in here about art and muses, and we talked a little bit about the the utility role that art plays in the preservation of history. And kind of the miracle that we live in today, knowing what people look like, and, and I'll explain again. You certainly know what you looked like when you were a baby, because there's pictures, there's probably videotapes, film, whatever. But when you look throughout the history of the world, think about how how foreign that would be to people if you went back to somebody 200 years ago 300 years ago and you said that you knew what you looked like as a baby they would that would make no sense to them because there was just no way to preserve that you would you'd have no idea what you looked like as a baby you'd have no idea what you looked like as a child and as a matter of fact it even extends beyond that if you lived 200 years ago, you'd have no idea what your great-grandparents looked like. And you'd probably have very little idea if your grandparents had died before you were born, you wouldn't have much idea unless somebody had drawn a picture of them. And if you've ever if you've ever tried <laughs> drawing pictures of people, it, it is really, really challenging capturing what somebody looks like. And even if you're able to do it, you're only capturing them in that particular moment at that age, whatever it happens to be. So this idea that you know what you look like as a child, you know what your grandparents... I, I have picture a picture of my grandmother when she was something like three years old. That again, you go back in time, and this would have been so foreign to people the idea to even know what your grandmother looked like when she was three. You know what your grandmother looks like right this second. You don't, you, you would forget what they looked like 10, 20, 30 years ago, but we, we're creating this new world now where you, where we'll get to a point where you could literally say, Hey, what did I look like? the Tuesday after Christmas when I was four years old. And and there's probably a half a dozen pictures plus security camera footage and whatever else that has all this, all this information about how people looked. But th- this is, again, I'm beating this to death, but beating this to death, but, but it, it was through most of history, that was just a foreign thing and would make no sense to people that we have this ability to capture and preserve this information this way. And so the best that we had through most of history was painting. And so it, it, so if you painted a portrait, it was a one of the few things you had to preserve what somebody's appearance. Now, there's a couple of different types of, of communication. And I want to, we're going to tie a bunch of things together today that I think you're going to find really, really interesting. Think of it from a communication standpoint. When you paint a picture throughout history, when somebody painted a picture, what they were doing was creating communication through time. So if I were to paint a picture of George Washington, for example, uh, back back when when you know the early days of the country, because that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today. When they painted a picture of George Washington, it was a communication through time. We would know what George Washington looked like, and it was being preserved so that a hundred years from now we would know what he looked like, and two hundred years from then we'd know what he looked like, and three hundred and four hundred. It was again a communication through time. And over the ages, our ability to communicate through time got better and better and better. In the 1400s, when the printing press was was created, it, it was a whole new way of communicating through time. You could write things, you could publish a book, you could print papers, and then that 
that information would be able to be preserved through time. If you wrote in a journal 500 years ago, that was a that was again communication through time, letting people in the future know what was happening at that moment. So while communication through time was being improved incrementally throughout history, communication through space had almost no advancements. While, while communication through time was being improved through language, through painting, different types of art, whatever, it was getting better and better and better. Communication through space basically was, was stuck in how fast can one, a person get from here to there? Because if you wanted to communicate something through space, it was rendered to how fast a human can travel. Pretty much it. So if I've got information I need to share, if I've got a letter, if I've got whatever it happens to be, or if I need to go tell somebody something, that was it. Get on a horse, get on a train. How, it, it, the only way it was improving was, how, was improving through how fast a human being can get from one spot to another. That was, that was really what it was rendered to through most of history. So, in the early days of the United States, one of the most famous portrait painters, and this would have been the, the communication idea of communicating through time. In other words, you were capturing somebody's image, and then that, informa- that, that visual would then would be able to transcend time and move through the ages. One of the most famous painters in the early United States was a guy by the name of Samuel Morse. And Samuel Morse was born in 1791. And so the early days of the country. And he was fascinated with art and painting, and he was pretty good at it. And he graduated from Yale in 1810. And in 1811, he went to England to study art and to study painting. And he, while he was there, he was there for three years, he created some, a couple of iconic paintings that are still revered today. One of them was called uh, Dying Hercules, and he painted this in 18, 1811. And it, it was, of course, the, the War of 1812 was happening at that point. He's living in England, and so there's the, you know, the, this conflict that's happening. And some people believe that his Dying Hercules painting that he did was symbolic of what was going on in that, in that battle. And then he did another painting while he was there called The Judgment of Jupiter. And it's another iconic painting, famous. And, and so, so he's over in England and he's mastering his craft as a painter. But he comes back to the United States thinking that he's has this, you know, he's going to be creating these masterpieces, preserving uh, the, these great stories from history and it, and these great images, these historical images of <laughs> of mythology and legend, but what he finds when he gets back here is that nobody's really particularly interested in that. What they're interested in, getting back to what we talked about a minute ago, is paint a picture of me. And so, the, he found that the only way that he could make money as a painter was to paint pictures on commission of people. And so he actually became one of the best known because of this. He was so skilled at at painting the human form that he would get these commissions to go paint uh, significant people. So as a matter of fact, in in 1816, he painted a really well-known portrait of uh, John Adams, who's a former president of the United States. And then in 1820, he was commissioned to paint a portrait of, of James Monroe, who was the president of the United States at the time. And that painting still hangs in the White House. And, and these other paintings I talk about are in various art galleries. And you, his, his work became uh, kind of legendary. And people around the country knew who he was because he was so great at painting portraits. And again, this is that communication through time. We're preserving what somebody looks like right now. 
And then that's being like, like the painting of James Monroe that sits in the White House. This was, again, communication through time. And so in, uh, in, in 1822, he wanted to get back to preserving uh, something else because he, as he's looking across this brand new country of the United States, he's realizing that people are not privy to what happens, for example, in Washington, D.C. He's been there now and he's painted these, these presidents and, and so he thinks, rather than try to capture these grand moments and preserve these, these moments of history, I want to go paint the House of Representatives in session and just give a, a glimpse of what that looks like. Again, to communicate through time. And so what he does is he goes to, this is in 1822, 1823, this period of time when he does this, he goes to the House of Representatives and he meticulously over about four month period of time paints this unbelievable image where he captures 80, about 80 different people that were currently serving at the time. And he captures their likeness, but not as portraits, he captures it in action. And so he gets the, this grand image. And I mean, I think this painting is something like 11 feet. It, it, it's huge. And he captures this grand image of all of the people working in the House of Representatives at the time and what it looked like if you were just to walk in there on a regular day. And you'd see a couple of people over here talking and some other people over here working on something and a small group over here and then one person sitting alone over here. And that's what he wanted to capture. And he wanted other people throughout the country to see what this looked like. If you were just to be in the, because most people would never be able to experience this. And again, to us today, this doesn't, to, to us today, it doesn't make sense because you get online, you can find millions of pictures of everyday stuff going on in the Capitol building. This was not like that back then. And so he felt this urge to, to capture these things and, and then take it around the country and show people what this looked like, what it, day, what it looked like, normal democracy in action, representative democracy in action. So he painted this beautiful painting and took it around and, and had this intention of taking it around the country. And eh, it didn't get, wasn't super well received. Not a lot of people cared that much about it. But today, that painting, I think it's in the National Archives. Uh, the, the, uh, anyway, but it's still, you can still go see that painting. And, it was, and today we see it as a masterpiece. And this beautiful moment where he captured life what was happening in that moment, and then captured the images of all these different people, the actual people that were there at the time. So in other words, he kind of like made 80 portraits, amazingly, in this, in this painting. So then he, he did that in 1822, 23, didn't really do much for him financially. And, he, and, and as, it, as with a lot of artists, he was out trying to make money painting people's painting images of people on commission, but it didn't pay well. Kind of like most artists, even today, it didn't make a lot of money doing it. And so in 1924, though, he had a commission that he thought was going to make all the difference in the world for him. He was, uh, he was commissioned to go paint the, uh, an image of the Marquis de Lafayette who was traveling to America from France. And this was in 1824. And of course, he, he was instrumental in the Revolutionary War. And in, he, he was a, just a well-known military guy and leader and throughout France and throughout the United States, kind of a legend. And he was coming back to the United States um, kind of on a heroic visit. And I think it was the city of New York uh, asked Samuel Morse to come paint this image of him. And if you ever see this painting, it's, be it's beautiful. It's a beautiful painting. And it's a full-length image of the Marquis de Lafayette. And, he, and in this painting, you have, in the painting, 
you have sculpture busts of George Washington and Benjamin Franklin because the Marquis de Lafayette and George Washington were like super, super close friends. And again, he was instrumental in, in the Revolutionary War. And so he paints this grand painting and he goes to New York where he, to begin painting this, this image. And then he has, and, he's, and he and his wife, he's married and has a couple of kids. His wife's living back in Connecticut. They think this is going to be the thing that turns the tide for him. Where he's basically a struggling, starving artist. Even though he's known all over the country, he, he's basically living like a peasant. Because there's not a lot of money to be made. And so they think this is going to be the thing that changes everything for you. This is really, really, really going to put you on the map. And the fact that you've been commissioned to make this painting with, uh, of this person, this, this legend. And so he goes to New York and he begins doing this painting. And while he's there, he gets a letter from his wife even that even says that this is going to be a big thing for us. And he writes a letter back to her and says, I... And it just says simply, I'd love to hear from you and I, I can't wait for your next letter. Again, because communication back then was as fast as a human could get back and forth. Well, the next letter that he receives from home is not from his wife or not from his wife. It's from his father. And it begins with the words, my heart is in pain and deeply sorrowful. Because during the time from the last letter to this letter, his wife has given birth to their third child and not long after giving birth, as a result of complications from the birth, she has some sort of a heart attack and she dies. And his father's writing him this letter to let him know that his wife has died. So Samuel, as fast as he can, gets out of New York and heads to Connecticut to be there. And by the time he arrives, there's already been a funeral and she's already buried. And so rewind a second and think about this that we talked about earlier these two different kinds of communication. There's the communication through time and there's the communication through space. This is an example of how we had made so few advancements in the communication through space because he had to, his, his wife dies, father has to craft a letter, writes the letter, hands it to somebody who then it, it, whether it was the mail or however they did it at, the, at that particular time in that situation, had to get it to him in New York. He receives it, and then he has to then travel back. And it, 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 we, I, I know I've talked about this in past shows, but we don't, we can't even appreciate the world that they lived in because so often if you were traveling and you were, you'd say goodbye to somebody, for all you knew, it really was goodbye. You'd never see them again. Especially if you were traveling over the ocean. If you were traveling from England to the United States, which happened frequently, there was a chance that you'd never hear from these people. And this is one of the reasons that you, when people were obsessed back then with their health. And if you ever read letters from people back and forth, it's super common that they'd spend a large portion of the letter explaining how they're doing. I had, you know, I had, my was uh, wasn't able to sleep well the other night, and and uh, and Junior is having a little bit of a cough, and and I haven't been feeling. I've got an ache in my leg, you know, just this kind of stuff. They would just go over and over and over again in letters to each other, because you were always two or three days away from dying. You just didn't know, and when an illness or a, a uh, some sort of sickness would move through a town. Everybody's fine one day. Everybody's sick two days later. And four days later, everybody's dying. I mean, this was, this was what happened. And we, we can't relate to that today. It makes no sense to us. And then 
the embalming and preservation at the time was a totally different thing and because there was no refrigeration there was no way of really managing this and so when somebody passed away you had you got them in the ground within a day or two you didn't wait a long a long time because there just really wasn't any great way of preserving people so this is devastating to samuel and he goes back there his wife's already buried and you know they had these now he had this newborn and he had of course family members helping take care of the children and because he has to continue his work and try to make money he finishes this painting which again is this legendary painting of uh <clears throat> of Mar of marquis de lafayette and he he continues on trying to to uh with his painting and and unfortunately doesn't really do well financially ever <laughs> he just kind of survives doing it and he's revered around the country as being one of the greats but still he's not a a accomplishing much with it he becomes the president of the national academy of design i mean he's a very very well respected person well, in 1831, again, with this desire to share the world with the people in America, he travels to France. And while he's there, he goes into the Louvre. And he actually spends a couple of months there. Because, again, the communication thing, most people in the United States would not only never be able to visit there, they would never really even know what the, the, this beautiful art looked like that was there. And so he takes it upon himself to go to the Louvre and he spends a few months there walking the halls and looking at all the great paintings and what he did is he actually recreated them and he made this massive painting. It's about, six, I think it's uh, six feet by nine feet. And the painting was called The Gallery of the Louvre. And I mean, you're talking about everything. He, he, re, he recreated the Mona Lisa. And he recreated so many of these great masterpieces. And he created a virtual gallery of the Louvre that he could then bring back to the United States so people could see what was there and this is again the communication through time he wanted to be able to preserve the things that were over there that that people would in the united states would never be able to see bring it back to the united states so through time people would be able to experience what was over there not understanding what was going to happen in the future obviously so he brings it back there and then he takes this thing on something of a tour so that people around the country would be able to experience what he was able to experience while he was there. Well, then this is where everything changed for him. And this is where the story becomes unbelievable. <laughs> and, and, and it will get and this is where you'll see why I'm so fixated especially in this discussion with these two types of communication there's communication through space communication through time because there was no such thing as really instant communication back then everything was communication through time other than if you were in the room with somebody that was the only communication through through space that was instant all other communication through space was communication through time so I want to read this thing to you and this was this is just a little overview of what happened with him at this point in 1832 Samuel Morse a successful American painter and sculptor was on a voyage across the Atlantic in, a, in the packet ship Scully he happened to get into an after-dinner chat with Dr. Charles Jackson of Boston, who had been attending lectures on electricity in Paris. So keep in mind, 
with, with, just so as a side note, this is Samuel Morse, who spent the last, I don't know how long, year or so in France. He spent months and months and months at the Louvre recreating paintings to bring back to the United States so people could see what he's... And he, while he's on this ship heading back to the United States to communicate these beautiful things that are over there to the people that live in the United States, he gets into an, uh, an after-dinner chat with Dr. Dr. Charles Jackson of Boston who'd been attending lectures on electricity in Paris. Dr. Jackson had an electromagnet in his luggage, and he remarked to Morse that its power was greatly increased by winding it with a wire through which an electric current was passed. Another passenger asked how fast electricity traveled. Instantaneously, replied Jackson. Benjamin Franklin found that out long ago in Philadelphia. Morse who had always been interested in electricity, thought for a moment and then asked Jackson, have you seen the semaphore signals that they send in various parts of Europe? If the presence of electricity can be made visible in any part of the circuit, why cannot we signal messages that way? We could send news thousands of miles in a flash. Everyone smiled tolerantly, (laughs) but after further talks with Dr. Jackson, the life interest of Samuel Morse changed from art to telegraphy. When his ship reached New York, he had already worked out the famous Morse code and was thinking over the problems of transmission by electricity. As he was leaving the Sully, the ship, he said to the captain, Sir, if in the future you should hear of the electric telegraph, As one of the wonders of the world, please remember that the discovery was made upon your good ship. And then it says for the next five years, Morse worked upon his idea. Now, I'm going to throw a side note in here. He finished his painting, the the painting we talked about called the Gallery of the Louvre. And although he remained... Uh, working in, 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 in different uh, capacities as, an, uh, as a leader in art, he became fixated on this idea. How can we communicate instantly? Because he, is, he has spent his life focusing on painting, which is communication through time. And while he's in the process of bringing back to the United States a painting that was going to bring back to the people of the United States what it looks like in the Louvre in France. Again, communicating through, through time. Moving through space to communicate through time. To bring back to the United States to show them what it looks like over there. Fixated on this ability to, to communicate through space, or sorry, communicate through time, by bringing these paintings to the United States, he stumbles across the thought, hey, we can communicate through space instantly if we take advantage of this this technology. And of course, this man who had to miss his own wife's funeral and burial because of how slow communication took place throughout all all of human history, as I said earlier, we'd made almost no developments. While we'd gotten better and better and better at communicating through time, through the printing press, through paintings and what have you, we had made so little advancement in communicating through space. Just how fast humans can move. That was all we could really do. He recognizes this master at communicating through time that there is a way to communicate through space instantly so he becomes obsessed with it on some level and just his over the next several years is working on kind of working it out what would how would we do this what could we do with this elect and he starts working on little contraptions on how we make this work in 1834 now the other thing we didn't talk about was when the uh, 
Marquis de Lafayette had come to the United States. They had just finished the the Grand Rotunda of the Capitol building. They'd finished it in time for him to for him to arrive in 1824. They had several times commissioned potentially commission people to do artwork in the Grand Rotunda, some empty spaces that existed there. In 1834, Samuel Morris had approached the, uh, the government about allowing him to do some of these paintings, to which they denied him. In 1837, they'd put out some, uh, they wanted to get again, to commission some paintings or to be done for these various places in the Grand Rotunda, everybody thought that Samuel Morris would be picked to make some of these paintings. Matter of fact, uh, his friend Washington Alston had been asked to make them and he didn't want to do them, but he said, you should use Samuel Morris to make these paintings or to be involved with this. And this was going to be Samuel Morris's, Samuel Morris's, uh, key to financial success if he could just get that commission to do these paintings in the capital and it seemed like he would definitely be the person that would do it but for some reason they didn't pick him some people and, and even to this day nobody really understands why because everybody still to this day thinks why didn't he get chosen to do it they think that perhaps there were some people that didn't like his politics. There were people in positions of power that didn't like him. And so he got passed over. And because he got passed over and missed out on the financial opportunities that he would have had through getting those commissions in the Capitol Rotunda, which he seemed like he should have been the one to do it, he put in and doubled down his efforts on this. And so... Let me finish here. He was fortunate to receive technical help from Professor Gale, an American friend, and financial help from another friend, Arthur Vale, in the very same year at Wheatstone, and Cook patented, oh, uh, sorry, at the same year, Wheatstone and Cook patented their needle telegraph in England. Morse patented his system in America. Now, not only was he creating Morse code and figuring out how to get the code over a wire, the one thing this article doesn't talk about is the fact that they had a problem with how not just to get the communication to go through the wire, but how to get it to go through a distance. Because that's part of the problem here. You can, because the most they could really get this, the transmission to go through a wire was about 100 yards. And again, getting back to our communication, you can yell 100 yards. That didn't really help anybody. So he actually now not only developed this idea and patented the idea of getting this communication over a wire, but he also invented a relay, which basically refreshes a signal. And he could now get this signal to go basically virtually as far as they wanted it to go because of his invention. So, the, so he mastered the communication instant communication through space, through development of communication over a wire, through Morse code, and through the invention of the relay. Or the, the which was a repeater, which would refresh the signal. In 1838, he went to Washington, D.C. Oh, let me finish it. I'll just read it here because it comes out of this article. So, so important was Morse's claims that an exhibition of his telegraph was arranged before the president and the Capitol and, and his cabinet. This took place on February 21st of 1838. Though the instrument was made from old picture frames, the wheels of a wooden clock, some children's drums, and other junk, <laughs> messages were perfectly transmitted over 10 miles of wire. Morse had to wait five years for the promised government grant because what happened then in, I think it was in 1842, you know, the president was amazed and they were, but they didn't know what to do with it. And they didn't, they couldn't, he couldn't give them any money to go do this. So he went to the Congress and they actually made some contraption where they went from room to room and he showed how you could send the signal back and forth, at which point they said, okay, we will give you $30,000 to go create our first connection which was going to be from washington dc to baltimore and this is where this finishes up and this is so amazing this is so amazing 
Morse had to wait five years for the promised government grant. But meanwhile, he laid the first submarine cable across New York Harbor, insulated with tar and India rubber. After a grant of $30,000, Morse put a line between Washington and Baltimore. He first planted an underground cable, but later switched to insulated poles. The line was officially opened on May 28th of 1844. Morse stood by his instrument at Washington. Alfred Vail, his faithful friend, was at the Baltimore end. When the critical moment arrived, Morse turned to his audience and asked, What shall I say? Quick came the response from a young woman. Say, What God hath wrought. Perfectly transmitted. This vivid text leapt into fame throughout America. Now, I think that this article wrote it wrong because I think that what actually said it was a question, what hath God wrought? And that's from uh, the Bible, Numbers 23, 23. What hath God wrought? And that was the first transmission, which led to us sitting here today, communicating this way. Because transmission with electricity is basically the speed of light. He, this master of, of communicating through time, through creating these beautiful portraits of, of individuals that he was commissioned to make by creating, capturing what it looked like in the House of Representatives in an instant, in a moment of time, what that looked like, represented democracy, how it looks while it's happening. Not capturing some, this is the moment we signed this. This is the moment we signed this. No, 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 no. I want to see what it looks like just on a normal day. Going to the Louvre and painting all of these things so that he can bring it back so it would be preserved through time. So people could see months later what it looked like. What it looks like over the Louvre. I know that was three years ago, but this is what the paintings look like. Now, he was the pioneer of creating communication through space instantly. Instant communication where time wasn't an issue. By 1858, they had laid their first, the first transatlantic cable. And I think it worked for about three months. <laughs> and then about, uh, about eight years later, they laid another cable across the Atlantic Ocean that was more permanent and lasted. But think about that. In, in 1858, that cable, and we had instant communication through space. We had mastered the communication through space by making it instant, by laying that cable from the United States to England, and we were able to communicate from one continent to the other instantly the communication through space was no longer based on how fast can a person travel from one space to another we had captured electricity and he had created this thing called morse code now amazingly the painting that i talked about although it wasn't a big big deal at the time that he was trying to capture again these this communication through through space or through uh, through time the, the painting that he did that was called The Gallery of the Louvre, I think it was in 1982, sold for $3.2 million in an auction. At the time, it was the highest paid anybody had ever paid for, an, a, for a painting by an American artist. And his paintings are still revered as masterpieces and in various galleries and places throughout the world. But we don't remember him for that. We remember him today for being the pioneer for communication through space, where you could have an instant communication from here to the other side of the world instantly, which had never been done before. And that changed everything once he did that. And what's so fascinating then about what hath God wrought, that question that was sent across, because one of the things when he looked back and realized and was wondering, why was I not chosen to do those paintings in the Capitol Rotunda? Why was I overlooked? 
Why was I not chosen for this? And he later said that he realized that someone more powerful had chosen his path. He believed that somehow God had a hand in it. Someone more powerful had chosen his path for him. He had seen himself that his purpose was to be a great artist, was to create things that would go through time, preserve moments in history, preserve how, what people looked like, as we've talked about so many times in here, even in this discussion. But in the end, through that happenstance meeting on that ship, on the way back to America after painting something from France to bring back and show people, he recognized that there was this way to master communication through space. And he was the pioneer because he believed that God had set all these things up and caused him to not get these certain commissions and put him in these various positions in his life so that he could be there in that moment, recognize this, this technology, and then create and become the forerunner of the technical era. And all of our communication that we do today, you can trace back to him. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. Oh,